We see now three times in this psalm this word Selah. What does Selah mean? To help answer this, I'm going to play back part of a Bible class presentation from January 2004 by Brother Lean Rittmeyer. Lean's classes can be found on the Christadelphian Vault website. In the book of Psalms, this word Selah is used 71 times in the book of the Psalms and three times in the book of Habakkuk. People ask me often, what does the word Selah mean? And often, if you listen to people being reading the Psalms, they won't read that word Selah. So if you would read through the whole book of Psalms, you leave out 71 inspired words of God. Do you ever realize that? We do it because we don't know what Sila means. So why, what's the point of saying Sila? We don't know what it means. But yet, it's a most important word. Now then, there are two principles if you work with Hebrew words. One is the making it small, going back to the three-letter root. Now, Sila is already a three-letter root. There's three letters. Anybody who knows Hebrew? It's the letter Samech, Lamed, and He. And it is left untranslated, Sila. If you want to find out the meaning of a word, we go to the Englishman's Hebrew Concordance, and you look up where the word Sila occurs. And then you find it 71 times in Psalms, three times in Habakkuk. But it is also used as a verb. The first time this word is used, is used as a verb, not as a noun like sila or whatever it means, used as a verb in the oldest book of the Bible, which I believe is the book of Job. If you go to Job chapter 28, in Job 28 we've got this wonderful chapter about wisdom. He must have been observing people digging in the earth, first one, it says, as sure it is a vein for the silver, a place for gold where they find it, iron is taken out of the dust and brass is molten out of the stone. So, metallurgy was well developed in his days. He must have seen the mining industry and how they got iron and bronze and silver out of the stones by melting them down. And he saw that enormous labor, people sweating in the dark tunnels in, or in open pits, but why do people labor so much just for gold and silver that perishes? And then he is asking himself, let's see where it is, um, verse 12, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? If only we could dig like a miner, we know exactly, well, there's this wisdom, there's the understanding, let's get our picks and our shovels and we find it. So he's using that metaphor. The price, verse 13, no man knows the price thereof. Neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth in those mine shafts is not in me. The sea is not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. So why waste so much energy digging out gold and silver, having a powerful job and collecting as much money as you can? You can't get wisdom for it. You can't get understanding for it. It says, wisdom and understanding, verse 16, cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir. The word value is sila, used as a verb here for the first time in the Bible. So it cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange thereof shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of corals or pearls, which you find in the sea, for the price of the wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be sealed, valued, with pure gold. So the meaning of this verse, sila, is to value something which is extremely precious, much more precious than gold, than silver, and all the other things that are mentioned in this chapter 28 of the book of Job. And so, if you just think of this word sila, then those verses must have a very special value. 
for the person who wrote the psalm, who composed it, or using it in the circumstances he found himself in. As seen in the lexicon, Selah means value or weight. If we were to weigh the verses that end with Selah, these thoughts would be valued more than pure gold. Now, let's revisit the words with this in mind. The first section that ends in Selah is that of the state of David's mind when he had not yet confessed. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Even Christ says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the first works. So David here is remembering from where he had fallen, uh, what he had done to Uriah, what he had done to Bathsheba. The next valuable words is the confession of sin and being forgiven. So this is the next Selah. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not covered. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Notice this word, forgive, or forgave. It's the word nasa. You can see down here, nasa. It is found here at the Selah verse, and it's also found at the start of the psalm. This word nasa has the sense of lifting off. If we were to um, translate it as, as lifting up, it would say, happy is he whose transgression is lifted off. And you lifted off the iniquity of my sin. Selah. We saw the verses where God spoke these same words in Exodus 34. Forgiving or lifting off iniquity, transgression, and sin. We see this idea of forgiveness or lifting off is surrounding on either side the state that David had found himself in which leads us to the third Selah down here, the third most valuable thought. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance, Selah. See, David's low estate up here is being surrounded with the words of Exodus 34 or a song based on those words. He is singing Yahweh's words, songs of deliverance. And it is confirmed and repeated again down here. But he who trusts in Yahweh, mercy shall surround him. Taking these three most valuable thoughts, the sailors that are more valuable than pure gold, and giving them as instructions to those who most need it. He's instructing and teaching those in the way that they should go. These most precious Selah verses don't just apply to David's sins or Aaron's sins or Absalom or just of the past, but they apply to all scripture and through all time. We now go in thought forward to the New Testament times when it was said, each of you has a psalm. And it was also said, speak to one another in psalms. Paul writes an entire chapter to the Romans based on this psalm in Romans 4, verse 7 and 8. Now, 
How can Paul, also called Saul, relate to this Psalm 32? Would not Saul have burned into his own memories the events of the day when he was standing there gnashing his teeth at Stephen's words, consenting to Stephen's death, and hearing Stephen's loud voice cry out, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. This word groaning here literally means roaring in Hebrew. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my roaring all the day long. When we consider Aaron's sins down here, three thousand die in Exodus 32. David's mind became like King Saul's roaring after Uriah. And Paul, also called Saul, persecuted and afflicted the early congregations. Paul understood the poetry of Psalms. There was no need to add syllable counting or rhyme when he wrote out these words in Greek. The words of this psalm can be translated from the Hebrew in which it was written in, into this Greek New Testament here, and even from Hebrew to English and Greek to English, and these three matching parallel thoughts cannot be lost. First thought, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Second, and whose sins are covered. Third, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. In context, Paul is weaving in this fourth parallel thought. We see three here, and he's basing it on this word impute. Paul phrases this same thought as impute as righteousness. So just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. So to not impute sin, Paul's adding a fourth. It's the idea of imputing righteousness. I've colored it in green here uh, in my scriptures. If we go to the Java scripture website, uh, we see that this word impute is translated as counted, reckoned, imputeth, reckoned, imputeth, and it's all through Romans 4. And also down at the very bottom, he picks up it again. It was imputed uh, three times. If it's helpful for you, you can pause the video and go back a bit and color these words in as it relates to this psalm. Paul takes our minds back to the first occurrence of the word impute found in Genesis 15 verse 6. And he quotes it here. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted or imputed to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted or imputed as grace, but as debt. Now, remember God's character? It was grace. It had grace in it. Go back to Exodus 34 in the psalm. Yahweh, Yahweh El, compassionate and gracious. So David here is describing the blessedness, blessedness 
of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute or account sin. So he asks a question, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Is this only for the Jews and those that are circumcised, or is it also for the Gentiles? Paul goes on and he answers it over here. Remember at the beginning of this chapter, he quotes this, Genesis 15 verse 6. And again at the end, just like those parallel thoughts, therefore it was accounted to him or imputed to him for righteousness. Now, therefore, it was not written for his sake alone. It wasn't just for Abraham or David or Aaron that it was imputed to him, but for us, also for us, that it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Remember back to the psalm? We had these offenses, these transgressions, sins, and iniquities. Now, it doesn't just end there. Chapter 5, he picks up this account to him for righteousness or imputed for righteousness. And he uses another word for righteousness. It's justification and justified. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that takes us back to the psalm. David found that he could not restore fourfold those sheep. We saw the, the verse that David was looking at, Yeshalam, to restore, to make peace, to make it right again. So there's this peace in that chapter. There was a king that was to be born, a Shaloma or Solomon. And David named him Solomon and Yahweh loved him. So what Paul's bringing our minds back to is there is a greater king, a greater seed of David on the throne of David. And this greater king is going to be called the Prince of Peace, of Shalom, and of his government and of his peace, the Shalom, there will be no end. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the next video, I will attempt to set all the words of Psalm 32 to music. I've tried my best to use simple instruments of the past with simple notes as to not to distract from the words. I've included a few modern instruments as our ears may not be accustomed to hearing these instruments from the past and these words from the past. Thank you for your time looking at Psalm 32.